so uh, as you see, my, my topic is really the very general theme of God, creation, and the scientific enterprise. And I will, in fact, be echoing quite a number of uh, uh, points that um, Bishop Peter has so helpfully and powerfully made to us. Uh, and uh, I, tr I trust that what I say will be will complement that rather than uh, disagree or supplant it. Um, I'd like to begin with uh, reference to uh, someone who was a very dear friend of mine towards the latter end of his life, uh, the Reverend Professor James Atkinson, who was a theologian and um, an expert on Martin Luther. Uh, and he, um, he passed away in 2011, and for the last few years of his life, I, I got to know him, and uh, I really admired him and his, his warmth and personality. Um, among the, the books he wrote, uh, or particularly rather this book I've put there in the footnote, Faith Lost, Faith Regained, published in 2005, he made some very interesting statements, uh, as you see. Uh, Since the Renaissance, the modern scientific mind has tended to relegate God to the status of an unnecessary hypothesis. And theologians have long met such challenges in traditional terms, he says, but in recent times, well, some Christian thinkers have adapted Christianity and in the process undermined historic Christian faith. But he says, this is not the only option available to thinking people. And to, in, in summary, he says, the answer lies in a fuller epistemology and a profounder ontology to explain the universe and man's place in it. So epistemology, the theory of how we know what we know, or what we think we know, and ontology, our basic understanding of the nature of reality as a totality. Um, we need a fuller epistemology and a profounder ontology. And moreover, that authentic faith in the Christ of the New Testament is holistic and must, like the new physics, he says, reject the reductionist notion of physical laws as the sole level of explanation. Now, we can uh, be informed about and contemplate the subject of deep time, of past ages of earth history and indeed uh, cosmic history and we can take a purely secular view uh, of that developing history and of the uh, origination of life forms upon earth and of course many people uh, do take such a very secular view um, but we can still be unsatisfied somehow uh, as to whether this this narrative, which is both a cultural narrative and a scientific narrative, is self-sufficient. Because it does, of course, offer an explanation and an account of how the world originated um, and perhaps how it may end, but it does not tell us why we are here and what we are here for. So insofar as that is true, that perspective has its limitations, vital limitations, to each one of us existentially as human beings. Now, following on those uh, viewpoints, the, the dominant Western viewpoint uh, or worldview, um, I would say, is parasitic on genuine science. And sometimes terms like scientism or evolutionism uh, are used to denote this. Effectively, the modern Western worldview that we find um, in our media, for example, on the Today programme uh, most of the time, uh, and, and in, in every other uh, manifestation of that worldview, um, it is a subscription to a philosophy of naturalism or materialism, often expressed in the phrases uh, such as, we are nothing but atoms and molecules, uh, or that we are a cosmic accident of no final or ultimate significance. And there are a great many TV programs and individuals who um, 
present this view. Now, um, Bishop Peter referred to Peter Atkins there um, and in his book on being, and then and Brian Cox, particularly in his series on the human universe, uh, essentially argue that any meaning that we create for ourselves is only transient. It, it has no sort of eternal or permanent significance. Now, I, I want to strongly stress, I greatly admire the scientific work, and um, in Brian Cox's case, the popularization of science that he presents in many of his programs. I'm an avid reader and uh, a viewer of, of the, his work. And also, uh, one of my uh, um, favorite books uh, is um, Peter Atkins' book on physical chemistry. As a student, I thought, one day I will write a, a textbook on physical chemistry. Um, but then I discovered Peter Atkins and I thought I cannot beat him. So, um, but Peter Atkins in particular, uh, in his book on being, is he, he, he subscribes to what I would call um, hard atheism, as distinct from what I feel people like Richard Dawkins offer as atheism light, you know, L-I-T-E. Um, you know, a sort of softer version of atheism that doesn't uh, face um, unflinchingly some of the, the downsides of um, the atheistic worldview. But even from the perspective of science, uh, there are subjects um, here uh, actually referring to quantum mechanics that um, shake to a, a degree the uh, idea that a materialistic view is either complete or self-sufficient. Uh, these three gentlemen, um, uh, Rudolf Peerls, uh, John von Neumann, Eugene Wigner, who was um, a postdoc student of Michael Polanyi in, in Manchester, uh, they all um, are big hitters in the theory and in the philosophy of quantum mechanics. And basically their view is that a materialist view of the human mind is inconsistent with quantum mechanics. I'm not going to develop that now, but um, maybe in questions. So when we come to think about why we believe um, what we believe, whatever that may be, I think there are three main factors. There are intellectual reasons behind our basic convictions, there are personal reasons, and there are social reasons. And for different kinds of people, there are different proportions in which these are uh, making up the total totality. And for myself, um, I would put, I would guesstimate uh, that my balance of reasons are like this, say half of my reasoning is based on intellectual arguments, half is or part is on personal reasons and also social reasons. I, it's a bit like uh, C.S. Lewis uh, said that he believed in Christianity as he believed that the sun has risen, not only because he saw the sun but because by the light of the sun he could see everything else. Now, I certainly have uh, personal uh, and social reasons for what I believe today. And going back to my youth, um, I'm indebted to, uh, especially to this gentleman here, uh, Professor Ewan Squires, who was a uh, particle physicist, a, th a theoretician, uh, initially at Manchester University and then later at uh, the University of Durham, where he founded a a world-class particle physics theory group. And he was my Sunday school teacher, or one of my Sunday school teachers when I was a boy and taken to church with my parents. In fact, I'm the shy boy on his immediate left in the picture. And uh, Ewan Squires also, as well as you know, his technical writings, mathematical writings, he wrote a number of books, such as this one, The Mystery of the Quantum World, uh, which are, um, very profound engagements because it, as a Christian thinker, he, he sought to engage with the wider issues raised um, by scientific knowledge. Now, let us think about God as, as 
God is self-presented in, in the scriptures, in the Bible. Uh, for example, um, in Psalm 103, uh, God is revealed as, as, a, as an infinite being, but also as a personal being. It's not like uh, saying, let the force be with you. But if, if God is with us, uh, or if God is with somebody, um, God is with them as an all-powerful, um, infinite being, and also as a personal being. So the, all the psalmists really speak as representative human personalities. And we read here that, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we're formed, he remembers that we are dust. And of course, that's an interesting allusion back to the Genesis narrative of the origin of human beings made um, somehow from the dust of the ground. And in the next stanza, the psalmist expands on that thought that as for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field, the wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Now, I think that encapsulates the, the existential angst of a great many scientists and uh, scholars and um, academics <clears throat> as they grow older and as they contemplate their mortality and think of, will they be remembered? Will anyone remember them when they have passed away? Uh, earlier this year, I, had to, I was invited to give a memorial lecture to uh, a famous scientist in uh, my field. And so I suppose that the very existence of a memorial lecture is one way of perpetuating the memory of, of somebody. But for most of us, we may think, well, nobody will really remember me when I'm, I'm gone. And, and so the psalmist faces up to that uh, challenge, to that existential um, anxiety. Uh, but then he goes on, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. And then he, he comes in, if you like, to the axiom on which his outlook depends, that the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Moreover, he goes on uh, with a summon to, to praise this, this God, this Lord. Uh, praise the Lord, you, his angels. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. So while on the one hand facing up to the transience of life and the question of whether we will be remembered uh, in days to come, uh, there is a, a, the fact here that for those who uh, love this, this God, there is a destiny, a destiny uh, centered upon the eternal praise uh, of this God and, and implicit really there is of the hope, uh, or very nascent hope, of, um, of something beyond the grave itself. There is a destiny that we and the, um, the universe, considered as a totality, uh, has in the purposes of this God who rules over all. Now, uh, I was visiting Cambridge um, just about a week ago, and over the new Cavendish Physics Laboratory, there is this inscription. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. It's a quote from another Psalm, 111 verse 2. <clears throat> and uh, from that, we can infer that the works of the Lord complement the words of the Lord. Um, and as such, they authorise a scientific enterprise alongside a theological enterprise, which of course is why they have been placed over the entrance to that physics laboratory. And together, the, the combination of the study of God's words and his works um, is, has been understood since the period of the early church in the first four centuries and the Christian thinkers such as um, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Chrysostom, and Augustine 
uh, that this is that there are two books. There are God's two books of his self-disclosure in his words, uh, in scripture, and also in his works. And this is also echoed by quite a number of scientists, such as J.J. Thompson, who in 1897 discovered the electron, um, that in the distance tower still higher peaks, which will yield to those who ascend them still wider prospects, and deepen the feeling whose truth is emphasised by every advance in science, that great are the works of the Lord. Now, the rise of modern science was certainly catalyzed by biblical theology and by a Christian society. And I, I, I want to, on the one hand, stress that, but um, also to have a caveat that this does not mean, therefore, that science today is um, propelled or impelled to a great extent by Christian beliefs. Uh, rather, it's, it's almost like the um, Christian belief played a role in giving science a push in the right direction to get it in motion. But then there is a momentum. And so among one's scientific colleagues, there are many atheists, there are many followers of other religions around the world, and they all actually contribute to um, the, the developing boundaries of science, pushing back the boundaries of science. So personally, I don't agree with the idea of a so-called Christian science or creation science uh, to be distinguished from science as, as it is internationally perceived and advocated and developed. <clears throat> so um, I've now got a, a sort of overview of the rest of what I propose to say. Um, which is uh, that, um, firstly, to consider how uh, historic um, Christian theism, uh, Christian thought, how this parted, what it is, and how it parted ways with Greek science in the early uh, centuries of the Christian era. Um, and in particular, these headings, um, the de-divinization of nature, uh, the relative autonomy of nature and the unity of heaven and earth. Uh, then I want to think of something that Bishop Peter referred to, which is the stratified nature of created reality and the nature of scientific explanation. And lastly, to pick up um, a sort of hot potato of um, the subject of Earth's deep history of Genesis, Adam, evolution, uh, death and the primeval fall of humankind, and, uh, which are quite controversial uh, subjects, especially amongst conservative uh, Chris Christians. I put this question, <clears throat> imagine you're a Christian academic, maybe you just started, you're, you're self-conscious as a Christian perhaps, and you've started working uh, professionally in the sciences. What, what kind of philosophical or religious position should you seek to advocate and defend? And, well, for myself, I prefer to say uh, I am a, a theist, uh, so to advocate theism, but a particular form of theism, of Christian Trinitarian theism, uh, which of course is a big mouthful, but on the other hand, if, if somebody says, well, what is Christian Trinitarian theism? Well, you can start by explaining what theism is, then you can talk about Christian and Trinitarian theism. <clears throat> and if you adopt that position self-consciously, <clears throat> then there's a clear distinction from quite another set of competitive worldviews, uh, which I list here. Some I've already mentioned, like uh, materialism, um, but even, even it's different from Islam and Judaism, which are, along with Christianity, what are called, in umbrella terms, parts of the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, but it's particularly different from subjects like panentheism and deism. 
So then, the, the early Christians, um, by which I mean the, in the first four centuries, and by early Christians I'm particularly thinking of the Christian leaders of that period, parted ways with Greek science where it clashed with the central teachings of Scripture. And the, the way in which their, they worked out the, their differences over these matters served as foundations for what later would be modern science. So the de-divinization of nature, in other words, um, the going, moving away from the idea that nature itself is somehow divine. And as you read in the opening chapter of the Bible, uh, the sun, moon and stars in that chapter are quite shockingly stripped of divine status. Then there is the relative autonomy of nature, the, the, the fact that um, nature to some degree operates under its own laws um, and we'll come to that um, and then also the unity of heaven and earth the, there's a further topic of the comprehensibility of the world which i won't really have time to to deal with so the de-divinization of nature <clears throat> well the uh, central affirmation uh, of Christian belief, which is found in the words of the various uh, creeds and confessions like the Nicene Creed and the uh, Chalcedonian Creed are the, is, and the Apostles' Creed, are, refer to the absolute creation by God of a really existing but dependent universe, including time, uh, which thus has a history. I've been asked in typically sort of sixth form groups. Well, in science we learn about all these fundamental particles and um, their interactions and the way that they can combine to form molecules and so on and so forth. How does all that physical reality relate to God if, if there is a God? And I best try and answer that by saying, well, uh, my understanding is that physical reality is embedded within a spiritual reality, though not in the sense of pantheism or panentheism, but in the sense of creation by a transcendent God, a God who is um, distinct from and beyond uh, the physical universe, uh, first and foremost. Um, and of course it follows from this that the universe and human existence have a purpose and a destiny which are established by this God. Now, if we try and think about the relationship between a transcendent creator and ourselves, an imperfect analogy is between Shakespeare and Hamlet. Shakespeare, obviously the author, Hamlet, the creation of Shakespeare um, that operates in the play, The Prince of Hamlet, The Prince of Denmark, uh, as a, a character, and, and God is not a character in that play. Um, but another analogy is, um, is uh, <clears throat> provided by the writer Dorothy Sayers from the last century, um, who wrote an interesting book called The Mind of the Maker, and also um, created a detective series with a, with a protagonist, Lord Peter Whimsey, the aristocratic detective. Uh, and in the Peter Whimsey novels, um, Dorothy Sayers as an authoress thought that, well, it would be rather nice if uh, Peter Whimsey had a, a love interest. And uh, so she created a character called Harriet Vane, who in the novels, uh, Peter Whimsey married. Now, the interesting thing about Harriet Vane is that she was really a kind of expression of Dorothy Sayers herself, uh, in that, for example, she was one of the first women of her generation to go to Oxford and to graduate uh, in English literature with first-class honours. And not only that, but this Harriet Vane uh, also wrote detective stories and so on. So effectively, um, Harriet Vane was a, almost a kind of pseudonym for the author herself. And that captures very imperfectly the, the Christian story of God 
becoming a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. So, Christian, well, theism, first of all, if we just um, say what is theism, well, we can think of that triangle of God, humanity, and the world, and that, that God is transcendent. God is sort of hidden from our mortal eyes. Um, but in our human experience, there are many signposts to transcendence, and, and there are different signs that influence and impact on different people. Uh, for example, for myself, uh, music is, is classical music is, is very important, and uh, one of my favourite composers is Johann Sebastian Bach, and uh, many of his works are conducted by Sir John Eliot Gardiner, um, and uh, who says that Bach's music carries a universal message of hope and faith. And he also refers to the fact that at the end of his cantata scores, that Bach wrote those initials SDG for Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. So the different people, uh, different f fashions and preferences in music, obviously, and, and there are other things, in human love and relationships that point somehow uh, or resonate with a yearning in the human heart for something that maybe is beyond materialism. Now, um, in the presence of eminent theologians, I sort of feel presumptuous in putting up a diagram like this, um, but I was discussing with Professor Alexander over there um, just over a week ago about the fact that in the early church there was, things were not perhaps as tidy as they are now, um, in that it took time uh, for, uh, in, in this case, four centuries of debate to, to come to some sort of equilibrium about the understanding of the triune God, of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And, so one of the implications, however, of belief in God as triune is that there is a unity in God and there is also a diversity. And we should not or try to try and play one off against the other and maintain that one is more ultimate than the other. And so philosophically, in, uh, in, in looking even at nature, we can see that there is a, a great diversity the psalmist, for example, in Psalm 104, talks about how manifold are the creatures of God, but he says, in wisdom, you have made them all. So in, in wisdom, there is that, the unity aspect that underlies the diversity of, of all creatures. And as regards the, the role of God as creator that theology expresses, the role of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through these phrases, God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, uh, first article of the creed, the Son of God through whom all things were made, and the Spirit of God, the Lord, the giver of life. So, as in the opening verse of the Bible, um, and as we can understand it in our present day, this is affirming a transcendental boundary between the creator and the creation. And that the creation includes the entire universe, including its spatial space and time aspects. And so, because it's an absolute creation, this is not using any pre-existing materials. Um, and therefore, the creation of the universe from nothing was an act, not a process. In other words, it's, it's like a, a, a metaphysical happening, um, not, not a process. Now, by contrast, for example, the Big Bang, um, singular and unique as though it may be, is nevertheless some kind of a process. And, and from this view, it follows that if there is a God who has this relationship to his creation, that God is totally in control of the universe. It depends upon him for its reality and ongoing existence. And, and therefore it also follows that God is clearly revealed in the natural world. 
Basil of Caesarea in the fourth century said that if matter was uncreated, then it would from the very first be of a rank equal to that of God and would deserve the same veneration. So creation out of nothing, ex nihilo. But what is meant here by nothing? Well, <clears throat> there are two answers that are often given these days about nothing. In Christian thought, out of nothing means indeed without the aid of pre-existing substances. Uh, as, is, as I think expressed in Hebrews 11 verse three, there, are, there can be slightly variations in the translation of that verse. Um, but essentially, I, I think it's his saying that um, creation is not with the aid of pre-existing substances. But in many popularizations of scientific cosmology, nothing is the, the, said to be creation out of nothing, but this is used to disguise the actual assumption of, first of all, a pre-existing structure of rationality, of mathematical uh, laws, and or the presence of various quantum fields and vacuum energies. So, so nothing, from that point of view, is not really nothing, it's something. And therefore calling it nothing is a little bit deceptive and misleading. But also in scripture, we read uh, about creation from something. <clears throat> Many created entities have been created immediately with the aid of materials that pre-existed their specific existence. We come shortly to Adam, uh, said to be created from the dust of the ground. And there are mountains and mountain ranges that are created from something. And, and in general, since the world has begun, it has not remained static. There has been tra change, transformation, development uh, processes operating. And really the domain of science, properly considered, is the domain of those secondary causes the study of processes and their changes, the discovery of regular patterns amid complexity and um, involving inference to the best explanation of those laws and patterns. And there is a, uh, a task for humanity of engaging in the pursuit of science and therefore bringing uh, glory and admiration to the maker of heaven and earth. So let's take a mountain. Here a very famous mountain, you doubtless recognise as the Matterhorn, and we can affirm God created the Matterhorn. But the, other, the upper part of the Matterhorn um, is a fragment of Africa, and the lower part is from the uh, Jurassic Oceanic crust, uh, as is seen here in these um, schematics of the uh, of the overlying rock strata. And as you climb up the Matterhorn from one part to the top part, there is a perceptible difference. Um, and therefore, uh, it's best to classify the creation of the Matterhorn to immediate creation. So a child, you know, of age five in Sunday, in a Sunday school, um, ask where did the mountains come from, it's legitimate to say God created the Matterhorn. But as uh, people mature and leave behind childish ways and, and enter into adult thinking, um, there, is a, there is a kind of more subtle aspect to it that's very necessary. Now this distinction that I'm stressing between absolute creation out of nothing and immediate creation from something um, has been um, according to the 19th century theologian Charles Hodge, uh, a doctrine of the church that God created the universe out of nothing, but this is to be understood only of the original call of matter into existence. And therefore, theologians have distinguished between a first and a second, an immediate and immediate and immediate creation, the one instantaneous and the other gradual. And thinking of the subject of time, which again, um, Bishop Peter referred to, Augustine, uh, as a theologian, argued for creation with time, not creation in time. 
So time is one product of God's creative activity. <clears throat> and so if we write down t equals zero in the context of the universe, we're not only speaking of the origin of creation, but of time also. And therefore, from that angle, there is no concept of a period intervening before creation. And Augustine's ideas have, have become, uh, have been refreshed and reawakened in modern times. Um, as Alistair McGrath suggests, Christian theology possesses resources which are relevant to new scientific debates. So on this subject of space and time, there is a convergence of both classical Christian thought and modern scientific thought on the viewpoint that physical time is an intrinsic or internal aspect of the universe, not something separate and independent or freestanding as Sir Isaac Newton thought. Now in books on, scientific books on cosmology, there are, there are some kinds of graphic plot that recur again and again. For example, there is this plot where time is on a vertical axis, so that's the time or history axis, and then there's a horizontal spatial axis. And um, there are what are called light cones, which are represented there by the green arrow, which, because of the finite speed of light, um, traverse a certain amount of space in a certain amount of time. Uh, but there's another kind of axis, which is of temperature versus time, or usually on a logarithmic scale, uh, where, generally speaking, uh, as time progresses, there is uh, a decrease in temperature of the cosmic structures, and, and, it, and that uh, facilitates uh, the development of increasing complexity. So, overall, and <clears throat> I may be stressing this very strongly, the idea of creation ex nihilo is that this is creation by God from a standpoint outside of physical space and time. So if we draw in those axes of space and time, there is an unfolding of the universe, um, an expansion of the universe, uh, un unfolding as time uh, passes. But from our standpoint within the universe as observers, then there can be or may be a beginning of physical time uh, perceptible. And uh, <clears throat> George Smoot, the um, cosmologist, uh, has this, uh, voices this opinion uh, that the beginning is inescapable for cosmologists as it is for theologians. And he says, there is no doubt that a parallel exists between the Big Bang as an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. However, the Big Bang, as I've already said, is a physical process, whereas the theological um, biblical concept of ex nihilo creation is of a metaphysical act. So there may be a parallel between those two things, but they are to be distinguished. And therefore also, um, if God has created the universe out of nothing, there is no other agency or entity to inhibit the expression or imprint of God being embedded in creation. There is no other divinity or force envisaged. And uh, this imprint of God, uh, according to the fourth gospel is uh, apparent as a transcendent divine rationality or logos. And our formulations of scientific laws are really uh, a, an encapsulation of, of that. <clears throat> so nature itself is stripped of any attribution of being divine itself and it receives a relative autonomy of nature. Now, again, um, Basil of Caesarea, in the year around about 330 AD, said that nature once created and put into motion evolves in accordance with the laws assigned to it without interruption or diminution of energy. 
and he compared the regular cycles and laws uh, of nature to a spinning top that continues in motion after an initial twist. So in that sense, he was, he was arguing against Aristotle and, and as the, really the summit of Greek science. Uh, of course, there are things like friction. Obviously, a spinning top does eventually stop moving, but he's, he's using that as a, an analogy. And Basil commented on passages in the first chapter of the Bible um, about the earth um, bringing forth vegetation and the earth bringing forth living creatures, that, that God has empowered the very earth with a creative ability to produce such animals. Now, if we jump in time to the 1300s, <coughs> the John Buridan uh, developed Basil's ideas um, and led to the idea of conservation of momentum or inertia, a very key and important uh, principle in physics. So the relative aut autonomy of nature is recognising the real existence of the created world, the endowment of that creation with secondary powers, subordinate to the underpowering, underpinning primary power of God. So you can look for natural explanations for all sorts of stuff, from rainbows to reproduction. Uh, as we cleave by faith to God, who originates, sustains, and is the goal of all existence. Some, this also applies to human thinking, uh, because human thinking, um, I don't think is really, a, or human freedom to think, is not really a, a so-called zero-sum game. Uh, we have a genuine free agency. We're not trapped in a deterministic clockwork universe, but, but it is relative and it's never at the expense of divine sovereignty. Uh, an example of this is from the work of and writing of the Manchester scientist James Jewell, who, uh, who uh, established the, me the mechanical equivalent of heat. And he said, uh, quoted in this book there, the Science in Victorian Manchester, that by the grand agents of nature, uh, these agencies uh, are indestructible so that whatever mechanical force is applied, an exact equivalent of heat is always obtained. So, so he, was, he was thinking self-consciously, both as a scientist and as a Christian theist, and you know, linking those two strands in his thought together. So there are a number of things about the laws of nature that are stated here that are <clears throat> identified by Paul Davis in his book, The Mind of God. And he, he says that, you know, the universality, the absoluteness, the eternality and the omnipotence of these laws share remarkable affinities with those ascribed to the Christian God. So um, the key I idea that the law is divine is, is, is one actually that has been around for a long time. And you could analyze those comparisons with the divine attributes more thoroughly, but I pass on. Now, the unity of heaven and earth. Most ancient schools of thought assumed a sharp division between the starry heavens and the earth, and that the sun, planets, and stars were made of fundamentally different materials than those on earth. But early Christian thinkers concluded that the heavens are corruptible, uh, and that there is a single physics for the heavens and the earth. For example, Athenagoras uh, rejected Aristotle's idea that the sun, moon, and stars were composed of the ether, a supposedly divine, incorruptible, and eternal substance. And Athanasius developed the idea that uh, the word of God holds all things together, and there's no divide between different kinds of motions, straight line motions on earth and circular or for that matter, elliptical motions in the heavens. And again, Basil of Caesarea explicitly denied the existence of a fifth element or quintessence that was supposedly only found in the heavens. And John Philoponus argued that differences in star color and brightness indicated differences in elemental composition. 
just as with terrestrial fires. In that, he was absolutely way ahead of his time, centuries before spectroscopic analysis of the stars and um, showed that their composition corresponded to elements that we know from Earth. Uh, and this whole quest for a unity or, or belief in the unity of heaven and earth was behind the, the work of James Clark Maxwell, uh, who was inspired by that theological idea in his unification of electricity, magnetism and optics. So these days, um, the number of forces uh, are fourfold. Um, but they, they, even they themselves are being unified, although gravity and the rest of the forces uh, still, um, or quantum mechanics and, and, um, and gravitation are still uh, not fitting together, uh, as one of the questioner uh, previously um, perhaps alluded to. Um, and sort of Einstein, in the title of of his autobiography is subtle is the Lord, that, that God's ways are subtle but not malicious. So in consequence of this, uh, of course, science is concerned not only with discovering laws, but uh, discovering um, structures and organic life on earth, as Bishop Peter mentioned, is dependent upon the element carbon um, based on its fine tuning properties uh, and synthesis in stars for life on Earth to be possible. So that we Earthlings, according to this viewpoint, are made of stardust. Well, well, doesn't the Bible say Adam was made from the dust of the ground? Yes, but if the dust of the ground was made from stardust, it would follow that we are made of stardust. And this, this representation, this woodcut, this Renaissance woodcut, shows a man breaking through the crystal spheres, part of classical cosmology to a new concept of the universe where the focus really is not just on phenomena but on underlying causes and mechanisms and the idea that reality is stratified into a hierarchy of levels that again Bishop Peter mentioned uh, as being very central in the thought of Michael Polanyi and, and each of these levels so for example the level of social dynamics is, is of course the level at which social science operates um, and then more in the sort of hard sciences macroscopic behavior um, is explained often in terms of the underlying microscopic behavior and the techniques of electron microscopy and so on that probe what lies at the microscopic level and and also the cellular scale phenomena and the mesoscale behavior and modeling of um, materials, the nanoscale and the molecular scale of chemistry, and then the atomic nuclear and subnuclear behavior. There's this um, interesting reminiscences of a Nobel Prize winner, Albert Zent Gyorgy uh, from Hungary, that he says, in my hunt for the secret of life, I started my research in histology and satisfied by the information from cellular morphology, uh, I turned to physiology. Finding that too complex, I took up pharmacology. Still finding the situation too complicated, I turned to bacteriology. But bacteria were even too complex, so I descended to the molecular level, studying chemistry and physical chemistry. After 20 years' work, I was led to conclude that to understand life, we have to descend to the electronic level and to the world of wave mechanics or quantum mechanics. But electrons are just electrons and have no life at all. Evidently, on my way, I had lost life. It had run out between my fingers. So, um, the, as I, in fact, I'm drawing to a conclusion in a few moments, but, um, the universe has a hierarchical structure. Sometimes uh, the term a renormalization group view of science is used, particularly by the authors I mentioned there, Alan Sokal and colleague. And there are theories, theories appropriate for every level, every scale, for a particular kind of phenomena. And there are effective theories uh, but that are never in contradiction to lower level theories. And this enables recognition of emergence as well as reductionism. 
So we, we can talk and fully be home of chemists and molecular physicists talk about enthalpy and entropy and free energy, these thermodynamic driving forces that drive, for example, a polypeptide to coil up into a protein structure and again that are involved in the structure of DNA and in its role in the cell. Um, but there's often propounded, and for example by Richard Dawkins, a reductionist causal chain, starting from the lowest level of genes up to the highest level of the organism, where everything is said to be um, determined by the genes. And therefore, as he put it in his book, we are nothing more than selfish genes. Uh, but actually, that outlook has been superseded by what is called systems biology. I, and a very good introduction is this book by Dennis Noble, the physiologist on the music of life, biology beyond genes. And systems biology involves not only upward causation from the genetic code leading to the organism, but to um, downward causation from uh, higher level signaling. And also this fits in with the so-called epigenetics uh, revolution, the study of hereditable changes in gene expression caused by mechanisms other than changes in the underlying gene structure. So um, I'm going to just give my main conclusions now. I'm, in fact, I've run out of time to talk about Adam and evolution and that kind of thing, which maybe get treated later on in the day. Um, the Christian Trinitarian theism entails belief in the origin of the space-time universe by absolute creation out of nothing. Uh, but there are further important aspects as recognised in the biblical revelation which emphasises both um, divine God's transcendence and also his imminence, uh, his presence by the Spirit um, in the world. Um, and that's fully consistent with scientific models of processes within the space-time continuum, including Big Bang cosmology. And therefore, if, if we have a clear idea of what absolute creation means and how that is, in a way, the fundamental truth when you come to com link science and Christianity, um, different views of what has happened subsequently within the history of molecules and cells and organisms uh, and about biological uh, diversity. Uh, different views can be consistent with firm belief in absolute creation by God. And therefore, um, with uh, the study of science and reflection it engenders upon the created world, we may have an encounter with God in the greatness and glory of his majesty. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>